All right, so we are about to start. Uh, thank you very much, Professor uh, Francis Su. We are having Professor Francis Su from Harvey Mudd College. Um, he has been graduated from Harvard. What I like about him is he is um, advocate of mathematics. Is it a good term? I don't know. So yeah, his research is about um, geometric combinatorics. He has written one relevant book on the topic topology through inquiry. But recently, he has written another book, uh, Mathematics for Human Flourishing. And he will be introducing about what he have, has written in that book. I will share the link in the chat section where we can buy books, a uh, book on the Amazon. Well, if you are related to uh, a student or faculty of the IUPM, you can have a copy very soon from our library. So we have requested a few copies for this book from our library, right? Um, yeah, so except for you, uh, Francis. Thank you. Thank you for uh, thank you for having me. Uh, it's uh, a pleasure to uh, speak to you from uh, from the other side of the globe. Uh, and yeah, thank you for for having me uh, share a little bit about uh, some of my thoughts about mathematics and uh, what it's for. And, and maybe one way to think about this talk is uh, is just to ask the question: What is the purpose of mathematics? What's the purpose of a mathematical education? Uh, is it uh, just for the purpose of building credentials to get a good job, or should there be something more? So these are sort of the, the, the questions that I want to raise uh, a, a bit today. And I like this quote by Simone Weil, which says, uh, every being cries out silently to be read differently. Let me start with a, a, a piece of art. Oops, hang on one sec. I guess my screen share did not stay active. So give me just one second to put this screen share back on. All right, sorry. I think, uh, I think we, all right, so here we go. Just putting my screens back on. So uh, let me start with this piece of artwork, which uh, you're looking at in the screen right here, right now. This is a, a piece of art entitled Hope by George Frederick Watts in 1886. And I just want you to take a look at this for a second and ask yourself uh, what you notice about this piece of art. And what do you wonder? Just take a moment, feel free to, to use the chat if you'd like to, uh, to, to speculate. What is, the, what is this picture saying? What is the meaning of this picture? Maybe the beauty of this painting draws you in. Maybe you're asking, what's the relationship of the elements of the painting with one another? You see a blindfolded figure sitting atop a globe. Doesn't look very happy, does she? She looks like she's in despair. And she's plucking a lyre with only a single unbroken string and she strains to hear its music. And maybe only after some time, you might notice a single lone star in the window shine, uh, in, above her shoulder, shining out of her view. In fact, you might see it here in the upper left corner. And so you wonder, why is she blindfolded? Why is she in despair? What does the star represent? And why is the painting entitled Hope? And so though maybe you seek to find out more context. You learn that in the 1880s, the world was emerging from a great recession known as the long depression. This is the biggest, maybe before the big, uh, the Great Depression. And you might see then that the painting captures a certain pessimism of the times. And in 1959, Martin Luther King wrote a sermon entitled Shattered Dreams based on this painting, in which he asks, who has not had the to face the agony of blasted hopes and shattered dreams? 
Now, why do I open with this piece of art? Well, it's because we see, see it and we seek to engage with it because we all have basic human desires. It has a beauty and we desire beauty. It's relevant to our current moment of you know, great uh, turmoil and we desire meaning. It's captivating and we desire to explore it. It causes us to wonder, to ask questions, to seek its truth, to be willing, to be patient in waiting for a star to show itself. And so the question I ask is why don't we approach math, mathematics, the same way that we approach art? Every being cries out silently to be read differently. Several years ago, I wrote, received this letter uh, out of the blue from a, an inmate in a federal prison. His name is Christopher Jackson. He's been in prison since he was a teenager. He got involved with drugs. He never finished high school. And uh, his involvement in a series of armed robberies landed him in prison with a 32-year sentence. When you think of who does mathematics, would you think of Christopher? And yet he wrote me this letter. And in it, he said this, quote, I've always had a proclivity for mathematics, but being in a very early stage of youth and also living in some adverse circumstances, I never came to understand the true meaning and benefit of pursuing an education, end quote. And this is what Chris was writing me because he had just studied a series of textbooks from algebra up through uh, calculus, and he was looking for help in furthering his math education. So when you think of who does mathematics, would you think of Christopher? And yet his insights have inspired me, a professional mathematician, to believe even more fully that math has something to offer everyone. Every being cries out silently to be read differently. That quote is by Simone Weil, uh, who is a well-known French religious mystic, uh, a widely revered philosopher, but she's probably less well known as the younger sister of Andre Ve, one of history's most famous number theorists. And for Simone, to read someone means to interpret or make a judgment about them. She's saying every being cries out silently to be read, to be judged differently. And so sometimes I wonder if she were crying out about herself because she too loved and participated in mathematics, but she was always comparing herself to her brother. She said this, quote, at 14, I fell into one of those fits of bottomless despair that come from adolescence. And I seriously thought of dying because of the mediocrity of my natural faculties, the exceptional gifts of my brother who had a childhood and youth comparable to those of Pascal brought my own inferiority home to me. And I didn't mind having no visible successes, but what did grieve me was the thought of being excluded from that transcendent kingdom to which only the truly great have access and where in truth abides. And I prefer to die rather than live without that truth, end quote. Now, we know Simone loved math because she used mathematical examples throughout her philosophical writing. And you'll find her in photos of Bourbaki. This is a group of French mathematicians that included her brother. You can see Andre uh, here waving the bell, and you see Simone at left pouring over some notes. And it's hard for me not to look at this picture and wonder, not wonder, whether uh, what her relationship, what Simone's relationship to mathematics would be like if she were not always in Andre's shadow. Every being cries out silently to be read differently. Now, I'm a mathematician. You might think that my relationship to math has always been solid, and maybe you think I've never struggled in math. But I grew up in a small town in South Texas. This is in the southern part of the United States. Uh, this is a rural area with limited opportunities. Most of my high school peers did not go to college. I did have a bunch of supportive teachers who encouraged me in, uh, in college. And, uh, and I managed to get admitted to Harvard for my PhD, but 
uh, I actually felt out of place there because unlike many of my peers, I did not have a full slate of graduate courses when I entered. And I, uh, I did, I, I felt like Simone Weil standing next to future Andre Weil's thinking I would never be able to flourish in mathematics if I worked like them. I even had one professor tell me I didn't have what it takes to be a successful mathematician. And so that was a very unkind remark. And it forced me to ask, why was I even doing math? And so that's the question I think I want all of us to think about. Why does anybody do mathematics? Why is Christopher sitting in a prison studying calculus, even though he won't be using it as a free man, at least for another 20 more years? Why was Simone so captivated by transcendent mathematical truths? And why should anybody persist in doing math when others are telling her in subtle and maybe not so subtle ways that she doesn't belong? Now, this is an important question for all of us to, to, to think through because whether you're doing math or not, whether you're in a mathematical profession or not, in some ways, we're all math teachers. We're all, in, in some ways, responsible for the attitudes that we pass on either to our kids or to our friends. And in fact, studies show that parents who have math anxiety have a greater likelihood of passing on that anxiety to their children. We create societal norms about who does math and who doesn't do math. And so it matters what our relationship to mathematics uh, is like. And society is also asking what its relationship to math should be. Is math only a tool to make you, quote, college and career ready so you can go and achieve your real aims in life? Or is mathematics not necessary for most of us and only for the elite few? Why study math if you'll never use what you're learning? This is an important question. Probably all of us have asked and maybe our students have asked. And these questions arise because math is often just seen as a means to an end a tool that you're gonna use later rather than a pursuit that serves you well right now. And yet in a Florida prison, Christopher has never asked, when will I ever use this, has he? He's poring over textbooks, learning math in hopeful anticipation of its own intrinsic rewards. So if you ask me, why do mathematics? I would say this, it's because mathematics helps people flourish. Mathematics, is for human flourishing. Now, when I say human flourishing, I'm referring to a certain wholeness of both being and doing, of realizing one's potential and helping others to do the same, of acting with honor and treating others with dignity and of living with integrity, even in challenging circumstances. So it's not just the same as happiness and it's not just a state of mind. One way to think about human flourishing is the well-lived life. This was a way that uh, the Greeks thought about human flourishing, eudaimonia, they called it. There's a similar word in Hebrew, shalom, and in Arabic, salam, which is often used as a greeting. It's often, these are often translated peace, but to say salam or shalom to somebody is to wish that they would flourish and live well. And a basic question taken up by philosophers throughout the ages is, how do you achieve human flourishing? What is the well-lived life? Aristotle would say that flourishing comes about through the exercise of virtue. And you can think of virtue as a certain excellence of character that leads to excellence of conduct. So it includes more than just moral virtue. For instance, courage, wisdom, persistence, you can think of also as virtues. And so what I hope to convince you of today is that the practice of mathematics cultivates in us virtues that help people flourish. And these virtues serve you well, no matter what profession you choose. And the movement towards virtue happens through basic human desires. And all of us have these basic human desires that can draw us to mathematics. And so what I wanna to do today is just talk about a few basic human desires and how math can and should meet those desires. So let's start with beauty. Seeing something beautiful causes us to reflect, doesn't it? Right, like this figure in this illustration, standing before a mathematical pattern, beauty causes us to be quiet, to observe, to notice, to wonder. 
You stand in awe at a beautiful painting and you search for its meaning, just like we did earlier in this talk. The same thing should happen in mathematics. You see a striking pattern like the turbulence under an airplane wing or patterns in the sand or fractal patterns in cauliflower. These are governed by mathematical laws and they cause you to stop, to reflect, and to ask why. And the question why takes you from sensory beauty, where you may first encounter beautiful patterns, to wondrous beauty, the beauty of ideas. And from ideas, you begin to see an insightful beauty, which is the beauty of reasoning. In fact, this is often a unique form of beauty found in math. The demonstrations of truths themselves can be awe-inspiring. Mathematicians have a word for this. We even say that a, a proof is elegant. So you might, for instance, encounter the idea in calculus that you can sum up a bunch of uh, infinite number of numbers and uh, in some cases get a sum, like adding up powers of a quarter to get a third. That might, that might be at least mildly interesting, but if, if you ask, is there a way to think about this geometrically? Yeah, well, you could take a square and cut it into four pieces and color three of those pieces, and then take the remaining square and cut it into four smaller pieces and color three of them, and take the remaining square of that, cut it into four pieces, et cetera. And if you do that, when you color all the pieces, red, green, and blue, then every square, in fact, if, uh, of the red matches up with the green and blue. So the, the red, green, and blue areas are the same, and they have to add up to the total area of the square. So the red area, is represents one third of the whole square. So just from this picture, you can see why powers of one quarter actually add to a third, right? This is insightful beauty. The fact that you can actually look at a picture and grasp this truth in a completely different way than you might expect. This is the beauty of reasoning. Now, the deepest form of mathematical beauty is what you might call transcendent beauty, which happens when you see the same beautiful idea, object, or reasoning pop up in multiple places. It's like the universe is speaking to you, right? This is the feeling that often when you do mathematics that you're seeing something sublime, right? Maybe even divine. And the transcendent beauty that we find in the world provokes in us a feeling that there's just something beyond our grasp waiting to be found that may be of ultimate meaning. I like what C.S. Lewis said, speaking of sublime experiences of beauty as, quote, the scent of a flower we have not found, the echo of a tune we have not heard, news from a country we have never visited. And so in a similar way, math can feel transcendent as well. Right? When you see the same beautiful idea pop up everywhere, you think it's pointing to some deeper truth you haven't yet grasped. When you realize you've had exactly the same mathematical thoughts as somebody separated from you by oceans, culture, or time, you begin to believe there might be some universal enduring reality that somehow you're both accessing. Right? It's like there are whispers that are calling to us, but we have not yet found their source. Now, pursuing mathematics for its beauty cultivates in us virtues, like the virtue of reflection when you contemplate beautiful ideas, like you'd contemplate a beautiful force. It leads to joyful gratitude and transcendent awe. And when you experience beauty from seeing it everywhere, you begin to build what I think is one of the most important virtues of mathematics, habits of generalization, because you begin to expect overarching patterns everywhere. So for instance, when I learn a new idea in math, I often ask, what gives this theorem its power? What's the underlying principle? How does it apply to a more general situation? And such habits carry over to other areas of my life. When I'm cooking, for instance, a stir fry, I often ask, what general principles does this recipe teach me? Because you know what? I don't want to have to memorize recipes. I'd rather know principles like putting in garlic, at the beginning of the stir fry or uh, putting in basil at the end. Otherwise it's gonna lose its color, right? That's a general principle. And this habit of looking for general 
cooking principles or mathematical principles allows us to improvise new delights, right? We can make new dishes if we just know some principles. So if mathematics uh, is uh, beautiful, and if we want people to see its beauty, we have to think a little bit about how we might teach beauty. If you're a, a teacher or if you're a parent, how can you encourage an appreciation of mathematical beauty? It's a question I think all of us should ask. Of course, one way to do this is just to look for patterns everywhere in art, music, rhythm, culture, and call it out whenever you see it. Elegant ideas, elegant reasoning, or interesting applications of mathematics. Another thing I like to do in my courses is to make space for reflection. If that is a virtue built by thinking about beauty, why don't I just encourage some reflection? So I often ask my students to consider one idea from the course that you, the course I'm teaching, that you have found beautiful and explain why it's beautiful to you. I like reflection questions because it communicates to my students that they care more than uh, just that they can solve an questions, answer questions. I want them to be able to reflect and think about what's beautiful. I have a blog post if you're interested in seeing some reflection questions that I often use in my exams. It's called Seven Exam Questions for Pandemic, uh, and you can Google it to find it. Uh, another collection of things that I find beautiful, I, I've created a website called Math Fun Facts. If you Google that, you should be able to find it. It's a collection of interesting math ideas that I often use to start off a, a math course, uh, that, a lecture uh, each day, uh, just to show that math, it contains wonderful, surprising, beautiful ideas. Here's another basic human desire, exploration. Now, when I was a child, I loved the stars and I lived, as I mentioned, in a small rural town, a farm town actually, uh, far from any big city. And so I could see lots of stars where I lived. I uh, begged my parents for a telescope, but we didn't have the money. So I just read a bunch of books on astronomy and I dreamed about space. And my imagination was stoked by at the time, the, the journey of the Voyager probes through the solar system. And I saw pictures like this printed in the papers. Exploration is a deep human desire, isn't it? It's a mark of human flourishing when a society can actually spend the resources to explore. And I could explore these worlds even from my small little town, 900 million miles away from the rings of Saturn. Exploration, mathematical exploration is very much like space exploration, isn't it? Except it's a different kind of space. It's a space of ideas. You don't know what you'll find when you start. You send out probes to test theories. And just like beautiful art, when you encounter the beauty of math, you're motivated by questions. You're captivated by mystery. You're unfazed whenever you have a setback. And you make discoveries from a distance because the ideas themselves aren't physical. You access this space through reason. Exploration is at the heart of what it means to do mathematics. And you don't need a lot of resources except your mind to be a mathematical explorer. And so you can embark on an adventure from anywhere, a prison, a small rural town, or some far-flung corner of the earth. And exploration cultivates in us virtues like imagination and creativity. In order to solve problems, you have to dream up new possibilities. And math lovers like to dream up new ways of visualizing patterns, right? That's exactly what's happening with you know, the phone in your pocket and its GPS. It's basically helping us visualize hidden structures that underlie traffic, right? The, the, the things of the world. Right? Mathematicians like to see, look for hidden structure. And exploration cultivates in us another thing I think is one of the most important virtues of mathematics, an expectation of enchantment. Right? Explorers are excited by the thrill of finding the unexpected, especially things that are weird and wonderful. Right? That's why we go on hikes through unfamiliar terrain. That's why we enter caves that haven't been explored. It's why we like 
visiting the deep sea ocean floor because there are some strange creature, creatures there that we've never seen before. And in math, it's the same way. When you encounter a fractal Menger sponge with self-similar squares and cubes all over, and you slice it diagonally, and you, whoa, find a bunch of hexagonal stars, you're surprised, right? You're enchanted. And so we learn to expect enchantment around every corner. And that's, that's what makes math exciting to learn, right? It's the enchantment, enchantment that you encounter. And that's what keeps people coming back for more. And so in a pandemic, it shouldn't surprise you that the sales of puzzles have gone through the roof. Now, why is that? It's because people are looking for enchantment from mathematical thinking. They're looking for escape. When the world around you is in turmoil, it can be uh, a refuge, an escape to actually immerse yourself in a puzzle. And in fact, Christopher uh, and I have been working on a, during the pandemic, uh, working on a, a research problem together uh, with a, several other mathematicians and a paper is about to come out that's exploring something that I call the game of cycles. It's a game that I introduced in my book and it led to some interesting research questions which we've pursued, right? So for Christopher, math isn't just a tool, is it? It's hidden treasure. And so that's what we have to do. We have to counter the idea that math is just memorization. And we have to replace it with the idea that math is exploration, right? Somebody who memorizes math isn't going to know how to react in unfamiliar situations when they encounter a problem they've never seen before. But a mathematical explorer knows how to flexibly adapt to changing conditions, right? A mathematical explorer knows how to innovate. So once again, if we're teachers, we have to think about how we might teach our students or our kids to explore in mathematics. How do you make your classroom, if you're a teacher, a place of exploration? How do you train your students to expect enchantment around every corner? Well, I'll just offer a few ideas. Maybe you have some of your own. But one way, of course, is to change dull problems to exploratory problems. Right, a dull problem is something like telling a student to compute an area of 20 different rectangles. Now, of course, all they're doing is multiplying two numbers together and not even exploring the idea of, uh, of, um, of, uh, of what an area means. So a more interesting problem is to ask to create two rectangles one that has a bigger perimeter and another that has a bigger area. Ah, that's a more interesting question, isn't it? You might also give open-ended questions, uh, asking uh, students to, to, to explore what happens if this or that uh, occurs. You might showcase surprising, enchanting ideas in your classes. These are ways to teach students to explore. And we can all be math explorers because it's a basic human desire. Here's another basic human desire, the desire for truth. What is truth? That's an important question, especially today when globally political instability is on the rise. We've seen a lot of misinformation. Surely you must be following the news in the United States where you notice that, you know, a very large fraction of the country believes our elections were stolen, right? We, we have misinformation routinely shared, often because of social media. And so the question, what is truth, hits home. And I have friends who basically say, you know, it's too hard to figure out what's going on in the world. So why should I even bother? But you see, truth is a basic human desire and it's a mark of human flourishing and a flourishing society values truth, while societies that suppress truth have historically been oppressive. Political theorist Hannah Arendt in 1967 studied totalitarian regimes and said in her 1967 essay, Truth and Politics, that was another turbulent time, by the way, she said this, that the result of a consistent and total substitution of lies for factual truth is not that the lies will now be accepted as truth, 
Certainly that's a danger, but that's not the most important danger, she's saying. She said, the, 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 the thing we have to worry about is that the sense by which we take our bearings in the world is being destroyed. So she's saying when we lose our bearings, we begin to care less about what's true, become more easily manipulated. So that's like my friend's question, why should I even bother? But mathematical thinking should equip us to figure out what's going on and to bother. Math explorers are on a quest for truth. We wanna see how far the rabbit hole goes. We have a confidence that truth exists and it's worth finding out. In math, even when we produce an answer to a question we're trying to solve, we don't take the answer for granted, do we? We ask, why is the answer reasonable? Where does it come from? Why is it implied by what's already known? Are there alternate ways of understanding this idea? And when I see multiple ways of understanding an idea, it gives me confidence that I see the truth. Or if two ways of understanding don't jive with one another, it makes me want to dig deeper to figure out what I, where, where, the inconsistency is. And so a virtue that mathematics builds for us is a thirst for deep knowledge and deep investigation. So just to give a couple examples, a few years ago, there was a, a big news story about the discovery of gravity waves, how uh, gravity waves enable us to visualize the universe in a completely different way. And this is, you know, this, if you have any mathematical high school math training, you might remember geometry in high school. And, and if you read any of these news stories, you would have read that basically this is like uh, the uh, masses bend space time, right? That's, that's, uh, that's really the idea um, uh, behind many of this, the, the, these, these wonderful discoveries in physics, right? That, that, ma that mass bends space-time, right? And so, uh, so this should cause you to want to dig deeper. Like, oh, how does this relate to high school geometry? Or another example, we, in the news, uh, people have, you know, are asking, are face masks effective, right? And you hear debates on both sides uh, debating this question. How do you know for, for certain whether face masks are effective? Well, the thing about mathematical training is it should equip you to think for yourself, to actually not need authority to figure stuff out. So you actually be, read some of the research rather than rely on someone who just heard, you know, who, 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 someone that you believe, right? Mathematical thinking also equips us to think rigorously. At the same time, it causes us to be circumspect about what we know or what we don't know. We often, when we're modeling something in math, we state its limitations. In statistics, we're careful to point out that correlation is not the same as causation. And so what's at stake if you don't develop these virtues? Well, what's at stake is, is, uh, is uh, becoming, uh, is the ability to make informed decisions, right? Becoming consumers, uh, innovators, not just consumers of technologies. Uh, it, what's at stake is our ability to critique uses of math, to not be duped. Here's another basic human desire, the desire for power. Power is a, a universal desire, isn't it? But it often sounds like a bad word because powerful people aren't universally admired. And so to understand why we have to untangle what we mean by power, and I like to think of power in two categories, creative power, which enables sense-making and is not zero sum. It multiplies power in both the subject and object, right? So if I'm a teacher and I'm growing in my power to teach, at the same time, I'm equipping students to grow in their own creative power. That's a characteristic of creative power. Whereas coercive power limits the abilities of others for their creative power. So I'm speaking here then of what are the creative powers of mathematics? If you think a little bit about those, what those are, often people will talk about how math helps you interpret. It helps you define, it helps you quantify, it helps you abstract, to visualize, to imagine. Right? These are all virtues built by mathematical training that equip people with creative power. Uh, you know, in a pandemic, of course, you're doing lots of modeling right? 
you're str strategizing about what model's going to be better than what other model, right? You're you're using all of these virtues, aren't you, um, in uh, in deciding how you're going to model a pandemic, right? The power of generalization, the power of structure identification, right? These are all manifestations of creative power. And so as teachers, we, we should remember that, in fact, we're doing more than just teaching students how to factor a quadratic, that's a skill. We're actually building persistent problem solvers. Persistence is a virtue. And in fact, you know, when employers are looking to hire people with mathematical training, it's actually more important to them that you have mathematical virtues. Right? They could maybe care less whether you know how to factor a quadratic. They're more interested in knowing if you're able to interpret, that, to define, to visualize, to quantify, to create, to imagine. Right? These are the things that, in fact, an outside employer would be more interested in than whether you know a specific skill. And so that's part of what we need to do as teachers uh, is, if you teach mathematics, is to explain how you're empowering people with virtues, not just skills. Here's another basic human desire, desire for justice. Here's the full quote by Simone Weil. She's saying that justice is really to be ever ready to admit that another person is perhaps completely different from one from what we first imagined. Every being cries out silently to be read differently. This is a picture of my favorite Chinese restaurant, now, of course, you know, I'm Asian American. Uh, I grew up in the United States. I don't speak Chinese. And so when I go to a restaurant like this, uh, waiters often assume that I'm not interested in Chinese food because I speak perfect English. And so I was surprised when I went to my favorite Chinese restaurant that often if I went there with Chinese friends, I would get a completely different menu than if I went with English speaking friends. And what's interesting is basically at this restaurant, they serve different things to different people, right? Side by side, people in the restaurant were having completely different experiences. And uh, even when I ask for the Chinese menu, the secret menu, often the waiters will say, no, 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 you won't be interested in that menu. And it reminded me of what we do in mathematics. Often, we tell some students, we encourage some students to go on in mathematics, and we tell other students, no, 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 you really won't be interested in that. And so it causes me to ask, in what ways are we being unjust by encouraging, by giving completely different menus to different people? See, mathematical spaces in the home and in the classroom can be like at this restaurant. Right? Whom do we allow a peek at the secret mathematical menu? With whom do we share mathematical delights like puzzles, games, toys, news items? Whom do we shepherd towards doing more math and whom do we discourage? Right? What conscious or unconscious assumptions are we making? For instance, in the United States, you know, often people think of math as something that only boys do. Or if you take a look at the mathematical professions, it's mainly filled with white men, right? Why is that? And what can we do to change it? Because if mathematics is for human flourishing, you would, you would, this should bother us, right? Because we've, we've kept whole segments of our population away from the flourishing available in mathematics. and We don't even realize we're doing it. You see, to seek justice in mathematics it builds many virtues, among them a concern for the marginalized and a willingness to challenge the status quo. We have to think about how we extend a welcome to those who don't see themselves as mathematical people. This should be an important part of mathematics for everybody. I've written some articles. If, if uh, you'd like to start a conversation uh, with colleagues or with students about some of these ideas, you can find them on my website. There's a, a new book out by uh, the American Math Society and MAA called Living Proof, which I, I highly recommend. It describes obstacles that mathematicians have faced in becoming mathematicians. And of course, you know, when you think about how you teach inclusively, we have to think about who it is we affirm and whom do we shut down? How do we 
affirm what students bring, not just talk and complain about what they lack, right? How do you affirm each student's contributions? As I mentioned, we build virtues by thinking about math in this way. And, uh, and you know, when we begin to see how different our experiences are from our neighbors, we, we're gonna want the secret menu for everybody. So here's a main message of my talk. It's that we should think about mathematics as growth in virtues, not just growth in skills. We have to fight the one-dimensional view of mathematics, right? Often people think of math as just solving a bunch of arithmetic problems quickly, right? As if speed is somehow a measure of mathematical talent, or maybe the only measure, some people think. Whereas if you're a working mathematician, you realize speed actually isn't that important at all, right? People, you know, people ask me to compute the tip at a restaurant, but, you know, I, I complain about that because that's not what I do as a mathematician, right? As a mathematician, our desire is not to be, to solve a bunch of arithmetic problems quickly. Our desire is to understand an idea deeply. So we have to fight this one-dimensional view of mathematics. It's uh, we have to see that, for instance, uh, that, uh, you know, the, this one-dimensional view often is like, okay, uh, in high school, it's people rushing to take calculus, right? As if calculus is the singular measure of whether someone has mathematical talent, right? In the mathematics profession, it's, you know, boasting about how many papers you've published, right? That's a singular measure of mathematical achievement. <clears throat> and of course, this translates into, uh, in, you know, when people think about how they teach mathematics into measuring students by just a single one-dimensional thing, you know, how many problems can you solve? Whereas people who are growing in their mathematical ability are growing in persistence. They're growing in curiosity. They're growing in their imagination. They're growing in habits of generalization, in being disposed to beauty. And we should think about math growth in those virtues as growth in mathematics as well. Because we can't separate the true practice of what it means to do math from what it means to be human. And if you want to teach mathematics well, you have to connect it to the things that people long for, the underlying things that drive all of us, a desire for play, for beauty, for truth, for justice, for freedom, right? So here's a challenge. The challenge that uh, is a challenge for all of us is to believe that you and everybody in your life can flourish in mathematics. Who are you gonna read differently? How are you gonna have imagination for the sacred responsibility of teaching? This is a challenge for me too, because I've fallen short of this idea. I've written off kids that I didn't think had mathematical, at least sufficient mathematical talent. And often I've been surprised. You might have a Christopher Jackson in your class who has fallen in with drugs in the wrong crowd. He never seemed interested in math. Maybe he even seemed lazy. But if you knew what he was going through, if you could see him now, you might have read him differently. Now it's been several years of correspondence with him. Uh, he is studying advanced analysis and topology now. He's helping other inmates learn math in order to get past their high school equivalent, uh, to get the high school equivalency degrees. Nobody would call him lazy or disinterested now, would they? And would I have had imagination to, to imagine a math future for him if I had met him 15 years ago? So you have to believe that you and everybody in your life can flourish in mathematics, can grow in mathematics, we are not saying that every person learns math at the same rate, but what I am saying is that every person can have a meaningful relationship with mathematics, can learn mathematics. They may not learn it at the same speed, but they can learn. And how often do we write off their potential? You see, at the heart of what I'm asking you to do by believing in somebody's ability to flourish in mathematics is I'm asking you to love. And love is the greatest human desire. It's a mark of human flourishing. 
It serves all the other desires I've talked about for exploration, for beauty, for justice, for, uh, for uh, 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 truth. And it's served by them. And love, in fact, is the source of and end of every virtue. Every being cries out silently to be read differently because every being cries out silently to be loved. Christopher in prison wasn't just looking for mathematical advice, was he? He was looking for somebody to reach out to him in his mathematical space and say, I see you and I share the same passion that you do. And when I was in the depths of despair in graduate school and I was ready to give up, one professor reached out to me and said, you know, I would rather see you work with me than quit. So I stand before you and ask, who are you going to love? Who are you going to read differently? Here's a, 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 a reflection uh, by a, a student who uh, sent, uh, somebody who sent me a, a, a letter uh, after hearing me speak about mathematics for human flourishing. And he said this, he said, um, when I was in second grade, so I, he said, I read, I read your article. I felt compelled to reach out with a small personal story. When I was in second grade, I struggled with subtraction. I asked my teacher for help. She snapped, told me some mean-spirited equivalent of, you need to go figure this out because it isn't hard. And I returned to my desk feeling like the biggest idiot. I barely ever asked for math help after that, and I struggled for mediocre grades until college. But in college, I fell in love with an aerospace engineering major, and her deep understanding of math was almost intimidating. And at the same time, I discovered a passion for economics and through that math's ability to elegantly explain complex phenomena. I only have an undergraduate degree, but I've managed to work in applied math ever since graduating. Today, I do time series analysis in healthcare. If only I could tell eight-year-old me of this trajectory. Discovering the beautiful intersection of math and the humanities will always have a very special place in my heart and I love to share it with others. The path I've been on has shaped my perspective that anyone, regardless of gender, ability, race, or otherwise, can be part of this wonderful thing. You see, what he's saying is, is, is just what I'm saying, that like, you know, often we've had these bad experiences in math because somebody didn't believe in our potential. And yet many of us have now outgrown that. And how often do we misjudge people? Everybody is a math person. And I hope I've convinced you that at least everybody because is a math person because everybody's a human person and your deepest human desires reveal your mathematical nature and you only need to awaken it. And to love another human being is to see each person as worthy of the beauty and the joy that come from understanding. Who will you read differently? Thank you very much for attending uh, my talk. And thank you very much, Francis. Uh, we have a, a, a question, and it was indeed a nice talk. Um, I have a couple of questions, but I will keep it till end and let me uh, ask if our uh, audiences have any questions. So I can see one raised hand uh, by Ezaz. Let me allow him. Ezaz, do you have any question? I see your uh, hand. Uh, Francis, can you see the comments? I should I read it for uh, you? So, uh, um, sorry, my my mic isn't working properly. Yeah, I can't I can't hear the question, but uh, is it the is a question in the chat? No, oh, as as you can, uh, yeah, we can hear you. As as you can ask, uh, continue with your question. Uh, actually, my mic is not working properly. I just uh, write in the comment section. Can you please eliminate it? Look into my question. Okay, uh, Francis, we have one uh, question. Um, why we used to say mathematics by practice? So this is perhaps from some student. Um, that is the if 
there is not a case now how we can help non mathematics teachers to use math as imagination and creating visuals. Yeah. Um, let's see. So I'm not, I'm not sure if I understand the question. So I, uh, mathematics by practice. So we used to say mathematics by practice often. Oh, I see. Yep. And uh, yeah, the question is, it doesn't seem the case from, uh, after listening to this talk, or your opinion. Yes, so yes. Right. question is how we can help non-mathematics teachers or non-mathematics persons to uh, use math as an imagination or... Yeah, right. Well, I think part of it is we have to start talking about mathematics uh, differently, right? Like we have to have different uh, conversation around what math is. I mean, if you're a, if you're a teacher, I think it, it's helpful to help. Like I like to say, for instance, anything a calculator can do isn't math, which is maybe a way it su surprises people to hear me say that because people often think of calculation as what math is all about. And I say, no, the cal mathematics is about understanding, right? A calculator will never be able to understand in the same way a human being can uh, what, what's happening uh, under the hood. And so part of it is our responsibility to change the way people think about math. But, you know, if you're a teacher, I think another thing you, you, we have to do is change the way that we assess math. You know, we often think it's, you know, people, math teachers often find it easy to just to assign a bunch of problems and then grade for answers, right? And I think that it's actually uh, taking a shortcut. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's easier to evaluate skills. It's hard to, to evaluate virtue. But I think it's the virtues we need to stress in our assessments and, and, and a lot more than we have been. And I think if we start changing that, students will get the message that virtues are more important than skills. But right now, if skills are the only thing that appear on your exams, then skills are, people are going to equate math with skills. And I, you know, I take your point. It's not that I'm saying practice isn't important. You know, it, it's certainly helpful to, to know your times tables, to memorize them, right? But that's not math. That's just memorization, right? That's like, okay, I need to have automaticity. I need to be able to compute five times seven because it's going to come up a lot in my life and I don't want to have to stop and think about it, right? But that's not... I wouldn't call that math. I would just call that knowing some basic facts. So, uh, yeah, so I think uh, it's a hard question. It's a very good one. Uh, okay, I think uh, we have another question. Uh, it's written in the registration section. So can mathematics help in avoiding undue stress in the life? Um, can mathematics help what? Avoid undue stress in life. Uh, can it get? Can it help with stress in life? Yeah, can can avoid stress. Avoid stress in life. Yeah, so kind of uh, negative stuff maybe. Uh, so. Yeah, I mean, I guess I, you know, uh, that's why I, I look. I like the example of puzzles. You know, certainly some people use mathematical puzzles as an escape, as a way of stress taking. You know reducing the stress in their life certainly and i would love to see more people have an affection for mathematics uh, rather than just speaking of you know uh of thinking of math as just something you do that's dull and boring and that you compute but yeah i think it can uh, help you relieve stress um, but certainly you have to cultivate that you have to um, begin to have a different relationship with math Yeah. Absolutely, a question. Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, hello. Hi, Francis. Thank you. Thank you very much for this, such a great talk. Uh, I really feel like uh, being a uh, math teacher, it, I feel like very good because the the effects that mathematics is, uh, is affecting the students that you have talked about are very great. And uh, somehow I used to ta uh, used to think about them and the effect of teaching means mathematics uh, to the students and the general uh, people around us. For example, uh, in our uh, society, uh, I believe mathematics would, would really uh, means affect people 
because it ma it makes people logical and they think in logical way so for example like the proper problems we have in our society so uh, so my question is that you talked about simon weil she was uh, she was uh, uh, very close to her uh, brother and always means think about him that uh, he is a great mathematician in that time he was really great mathematician mathematician he was uh, solving the Riemann hypothesis for elliptic curves or finite fields and all these algebraic geometry that he started. And uh, Simon Weil was, uh, I think, very, maybe was very degraded at that time because of uh, his brother's uh, intellectuality. So how do you think that Simon Weil should uh, uh, behave in that situation? How can we, for example, if, if I, uh, I was in Europe and did my PhD, and at that time, I was uh, really uh, means uh, facing the same problem that uh, Simon Weil would have uh, faced. How yeah. can we just right. means uh, uh, means two such things means for for that thing? Yeah, that's I a great question. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so thank you. I yeah, I mean, I I wrestle with that question as well, right? I I met plenty of people who are you know who are I think far more supremely talented in mathematics when I was a Harvard graduate student. And I think that at some point, all of us will hit a wall and we have to stop comparing ourselves to other people. I mean, I think that's one of the, the, the main uh, temptations often is that math is often seen as hierarchical. People often think of math as linearly ordered. And so yeah. they think ranking people in that way. And I think the more that you that we begin to see that there's a lot more to math, doing math than just sort of linearly ordering people by talent. Once we realize that math is, you know, math ability is multidimensional, I think that will help us stop. I mean, like, I know plenty of people who, who have, you know, uh, uh, who are, you know, uh, more uh, skilled, maybe they're not Andre Vey and being able to solve number theory problems. But you know, you know some people who are better at geometry, you know some people who are better at thinking algebraically. But I also I also know people like uh, who are good at constructing examples. That's a virtue in mathematics, like being able to come up with an example of something, right? That's kind of like a, a very specific kind of um, a virtue that's not necessarily measured that you know people often talk about. I know people who are great at uh, forming, building mathematical communities, right? That's also a virtue. Um, I know people who uh, have a knack for being able to 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 look at a problem and in multiple from multiple points of view, right? And so these are all very different kinds of virtues that show up that are really important in the math community. Um, but we often ignore them when we think about math as being a hierarchy. Yeah, we do. We do. Most of the time, we don't realize that the, these things that you, you have mentioned are really important for the for maybe for teaching or maybe influence yeah. other people in, in mathematical forms. Man. Yeah. And, yeah. And the thing is that part, you know, part of the reason that I, of course, even wrote this book is I began to reflect on what are the things that I most enjoy about doing mathematics. And, you know, most of those things are missing from the way we teach math. Like I enjoy collaborating with other people. I enjoy brainstorming. I enjoy, you know, sitting with somebody and throwing out a crazy idea for how to solve a problem. And I enjoy the fact that with, with my good collaborators, I don't feel any shame in brainstorming. I don't feel shame in throwing out an idea that may not work. But you think about the way we teach math, we don't teach students to, to collaborate. Um, students often feel shame for, for suggesting an idea that turns out to be wrong. We only yeah. reward correct answers. We don't reward good brainstorming, do we? Right? Well, true, true. So there's a lots of things that I think are wrong about the way we teach math that, that you know, if, uh, but, but this is exactly what draws people to do math. What draws people to do math is often because it's beautiful, right? But we don't teach an appreciation of beauty, at least, at least formally, uh, in math courses. Uh, you'll, ca you'll catch it if you hear somebody talk about a beautiful idea. 
but do we teach students to appreciate or look for beauty? I, I don't think so. Not, not as much as we should. So yeah, there's a lot of things that are missing. I think this idea of comparing people is very detrimental to like it. Basically I had to decide at some point I was not going to compare myself to other people. And that al allowed me finally to begin enjoying that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for the answer. Well, somebody in the chat asked um, if I ever thought about dropping that. And yeah, I mean, I alluded to a little bit. I, I, I In graduate school, uh, I thought about quitting because that was the first time that I, I felt like I hit a wall and I had professors <laughs> felt that I wasn't good enough because I didn't come from Harvard. You know, I didn't come from an Ivy League school. I came from a small town nowhere, you know, uh, and uh, and so that was, you know, that was a time where I had to ask myself, do I really, am I going to believe these people or am I just going to forge my own path? And am I going to stop listening to the voices around me? And of course I had the fortune of, of another professor deciding to keep me as a graduate student, even though, uh, I had not been, um, successful in working with, with this other professor. Uh, and that's, you know, that, that professor, I, I owe a great deal of gratitude towards because he was, you know, I think he was uh, basically interested in helping me, uh, helping, he believed in me, right, in a way that other people didn't. And we all need people like that in our lives. Uh, we have someone uh, unmuted. So can you please ask a question and please tell us your name first. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, this is me, Pidawson Sheikh from Loud University. Uh, and uh, hello, Aslam Alaikum, Dr. Fransik. Uh, th this is a very nice uh, session. I have uh, some questions just like uh, humans uh, are finding the natural structures on the behalf of logical reasonings. So uh, there are so many unsolved problems. So if someone wants to solve them, then how to make bridge between two different uh, logical theories of mathematics? Yeah, how do you make a bridge? I don't know if I can answer that question because it's really specific. I mean, depending on the kinds of things, you, the bridge you want to, you know, you want to build. But I mean, I think generally speaking, uh, uh, yeah, let That's me maybe fine. ask another question so it maybe have to answer the both question at the same time francis so yeah. uh, you talk about that example of the chinese restaurant in the menu um and the justice so sometimes i as a teacher uh, feel difficulty in class and i see that if i am going with some topic and real analysis and at the same time if i uh, teach some other course like discrete maths mm -hmm. so um, in each course is few students are i mean their faces uh, say something they are, they are well interested and few faces are just like uh, they are not in the topic that much so how do we uh, yeah deal with that gap in the students so being within domain of the mathematics but two different subjects and... how do you how do you uh, i didn't understand can the we do justice with the students a class of the students like teaching two different topics and uh, I mean, how, how to make them uh, engage? Engage, yeah. In all is to to all is students, right? To all. Yeah, topics. that yes, that's very. That's a very. I mean, that's so we're not always going to be successful, but we have to try. Mm -hmm. And I think part of it is that you know different students have different ways that they come into math, right? Like, for instance, I didn't think of myself as somebody who liked algebra but I love geometry and topology, right? Um, currently in the United States, in most math major programs, you have to come through calculus, right? And that right there already weeds out some people who decided they don't like calculus and they never want to take another class. But there's no reason calculus has to be the entryway into the math major. Discrete mathematics often captivates students who aren't interested in calculus and you know, has, is very beautiful and often makes students interested. So I think often um, 
we have to broaden the, 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 the pathways into, into the study of mathematics. Um, so that's one, one thing. It's not teacher-based. That's more a question of how do you allow students to, to, to figure out ways that they, they might connect with math. But then in, inside the classroom, you know, you do have students who have varying abilities. And, uh, and so we have to think very carefully. Often, um, you know, for instance, if I'm teaching a class where I have a wide range of abilities, you have to pick examples that relate to students uh, on multiple different levels. You have to pick problems that have uh, what do we call low floor, high ceiling. So low floor means a low entry to get students interested in the question, don't need that much background, but high ceiling means you can take the problem and, 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 um, and make it deeper in many ways for the students who need more of a challenge. Um, that's a, you know, these are hard questions, but there are some, <laughs> there are some uh, people who have done some work on thinking through what are some low floor, high ceiling questions that you can ask. Thank you very much, uh, Francis, once again, and um, your spare time from your and she do. I think we do not have any more questions. But yeah, I have shared uh, the website and also the book. So if you want to continue uh, being in contact with Dr. Francis or Dr. Yeah, with us, so yeah, please do. Um, so it's time to say, uh, yeah. Yeah, but thank I, you very much. Thank you. thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Hope to see you again in some session. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you.